All right, gentlemen, uh, we're going to start Chapter 10, which looks at the presidency. Um, <clears throat> so first we're going to, in the first part we'll, hear, we'll, we'll break down the difference between a president and a prime minister, um, which are the two most common executive titles, I guess you should say, um, in the Western world or in countries with competitive elective systems. Um, and then we'll move on to where we actually look at our own president, our own um, executive branch, the powers, how it's actually composed. Everybody knows the president. I shouldn't say everybody. People who've had my class know the executive branch includes the president and the vice president. There's actually a lot more people involved than that. We'll look at that. Um, the evolution of the president, all that stuff. But first, let's, um, let's try and understand what makes a president a president and not a prime minister. Um, your book actually began by pointing out that how we get our president was the result of a last-minute compromise when they were sitting there trying to, to write out how we get our chief executive in the Constitution. In 1787, your book noted that, for example, James Wilson of Pennsylvania wanted it to simply be a popular election. Roger Sherman, father of the Connecticut Compromise, a great compromise, you might remember, wanted to have uh, the president selected by Congress which would basically be like a prime minister, as we'll see here in a moment. Nobody liked Wilson's idea. The size of the United States made it seemingly uh, impossible for someone to win a majority of the vote in this country, save maybe George Washington. As your book noted, the United States in 1787 was larger than England, Ireland, France, Germany, and Italy combined, or as large as. Um, <clears throat> Sherman's view was also not popular because people felt that if the president were a, a person selected by the United States Congress, that they would basically become a tool of Congress or a, a congressional lackey, a person who, of course, just did whatever Congress wanted so they could get reelected. Eventually, the Committee on Postponed Matters, which was a subset of the Committee of Detail, which basically was the committee that took care of everything no other committee wanted to take care of, this committee on postponed matters at the last minute threw out this electoral college thingamajig um, and of course then said if you don't win the electoral college well then we'll kick it to the house of representatives um, and the theory being that actually the house of representatives would end up choosing the president a lot of times because they assumed the electoral college would fail to produce a majority on a regular basis Turns out, 200 years later, the House of Representatives hasn't really been able to choose the president since 1824. That was the last election, the famed corrupt bargain election where JQA beat Andrew Jackson in the House, thanks to the efforts of Henry Clay, who then got named Speaker of the uh, Secretary of State. Excuse me. I will put an asterisk when I say that in 1876, some of you might remember the election between Sam Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes. There was a lot of voter fraud. We could not figure out who should have won several southern states. Uh, and eventually a committee made up of five members of the Supreme Court, five members of the Senate, five members of the House, eight to seven recommended that they give those outstanding states to Rutherford B. Hayes, which would give him a one-vote victory in the Electoral College. Um, it was a recommendation which was passed on to a democratically controlled House of Representatives. And a democratic majority House of Representatives actually voted to give the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes the presidency. Um, so I'm saying that's an asterisk because that wasn't actually the House of Representatives choosing. That was the House of Representatives voting on a recommendation from a committee. Regardless, enough of that um, political minutia aside, Generally, we get an Electoral College winner. Um, sometimes it's not even questionable, right? Now, <clears throat> I will say, too, if you were to take one of our founding fathers and drop them in the modern day, they would be amazed because our campaigns resemble nothing. Um, our politics resemble really nothing of what they knew. The only thing that remains from their time is the Electoral College. It's like the one thing that they threw in there at the last minute because they're like, yeah, we don't know what else to do. And it turns out it's the most lasting element of our presidential election system. Um, everything else has changed dramatically. I'm not going to say for the better or for the worse. It's just changed. Except we still use that, that funny electoral college system. 
And we will talk more about the Electoral College later on, um, but I like to just kind of go over that little intro your book gave because I did find it interesting. Um, now, what is the difference between president and prime minister? Oh, and I couldn't resist. Some of you might have noticed in the book that we start out the chapter with this picture. I love this picture's hilarious in my opinion. Um, I really wish that you could crawl inside the heads of these two men and get their thoughts at this moment in time because this is just funny. Um, in my humble opinion. But anyhow, also, there you go. That's how that's how recent your book is. Our book was published late enough that we were able to get a photo of, of Trump and, and Obama after the 2016 election, just, you know, chilling. Um, actually, I think they were having a brief conversation and a bunch of reporters were in the room. But, of course, our book isn't recent enough to be completely accurate because, as you'll see later on in this chapter, uh, when we talk about impeachments, your book needs some updating, which I'll do. Um, <clears throat> but anyhow, so what is the difference between a president and a prime minister? First of all, I'd like to point out, president, the, the idea of the people selecting a president, um, the whole idea of the popular vote or popularly elected president. And I realize some people are going to say, we don't do popular election, we do electoral college. Yeah, but the electoral college is based upon a popular election. The people still have a say. Yes, we have that weird system where we transfer your vote to another system, but regardless, you still vote for president. Um, the idea of a popularly elected president is a truly American thing. Your book noted there are only 16 countries that have directly elected presidents. Of all the countries that have democracy, voting, however you want to term it, only 16 of them have directly elected presidents. Um, your book noted there are five dozen or so countries where there is some degree of party competition and free choice. Uh, I am highlighting that. North Korea, I think, has theoretically a popularly elected president. Let's be real. That's very theoretical. We're not going to count um, military juntas and rigged elections. But in the 60 or so countries that have real genuine elections, only 16 of them have a president that's directly elected, um, so a little over a fourth. And of those 16, 13 are located in the Americas, in North and South America. So it is clearly an American thing. The more popular alternative is the prime minister. The prime minister is the form of chief executive that you will more commonly find in Western Europe, um, in Japan, in Israel. There is no nation with a purely presidential system in all of Europe. The entire continent of Europe, no one has a president like we do. Uh, Asterix, France does have a president, but the president is a popular, popularly elected individual, but they also have a prime minister. If you'd like to learn more about the French system, here you go. Um, this is the best chart I could find. A couple things. One, you know it's a bad day when the best chart available is on Wikipedia. Okay? Number two, yeah, that's the French system. Okay? The French people elect the president, but they also elect the National Assembly, but they also elect local officials who then elect the Senate. <laughs> The president chooses the prime minister who then chooses the minister. I don't, yeah, that's the French government. Um, so that's a class in and all of itself. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a bad day when the, the best chart I can get is on Wikipedia. And secondly, you have a very convoluted government when it looks like this. This makes our government look streamlined. Um, so again, the only people have the popularly elected president. Um, Primarily in the Americas, Europeans not a fan of it. In a parliamentary system, let's start talking about the institution you probably know less about, prime ministers. Okay, In a parliamentary system, the prime minister is the chief executive. It is their equivalent of a president. It's not their president, it's their equivalent of their president. They are similar, they are not the same. The prime minister is not chosen by the voters, but is chosen by the legislature, whatever it is called. It might be called a parliament, it might be called a diet. In Poland, it's called the sejum. Um, regardless, um, in, in uh, Israel, it's called uh, the Knesset. Um, but anyhow, it is chosen by the legislature. Okay, and then the prime minister selects the members of the cabinet. Okay, and they will make that choice from other members of parliament. 
almost always, not exclusively, but almost always. I think there are some countries where it's written the law. You have to be a member of parliament to be a minister. But let's just go ahead and, yeah, we'll say that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> in many countries, um, there aren't just two parties. The two-party system is not always the most common. Um, in parties where there are two parties, it's easy. The prime minister comes from the party that's in majority. In a country like Israel, where there are several parties that are all viable and competing, and no one party has a true majority, you have coalition government. And so what you'll have is a prime minister who is from one of the parties that make up the coalition. All right? You remain prime minister as long as your party is in majority, or as long as your coalition is together and in, and in power. Um, the voters do choose who will be a member of parliament. Okay, and they usually do that by voting for a party, not for actual people. All right, but you have no say as a citizen who is the prime minister. Like in England, no one votes for prime minister. It becomes known, usually during an election, who the party would name as the prime minister if they were to win the election. But you're not actually voting for, let's just say, Theresa May or Tony Blair or whoever. You're voting for the party. And then the party will name the prime minister if they win the election. All right. Now, whether you have a presidential or parliamentary system, whether you have our system or the more common parliamentary prime minister system makes a big difference on that chief executive and how they operate. So let's jump over to ours, the president. Right. You become president by winning an election. Right. People vote on whether they want you or another person to be president. All right. Um, it turns out. That, you know, while the prime minister is always an insider, they're always a member of the legislative body. They're always an existing politician, right? They're a known quantity. It turns out that in our country, being a legislator is actually not the way you become president, generally speaking. Um, between 1828 and 2012, um, 32 different people were elected president. I can actually update this stat. Between 1828 and 2016, 33 people, okay, had been president. Of these, the majority, the vast majority, were governors, military leaders, vice presidents, or a, a businessman. Um, <laughs> just 13% were legislators immediately become pre before becoming president, and actually that percentage would have gone down ever so slightly because I just said, again, I can actually add one more election to the tally. Um, but just 13 percent came straight from the legislature to become a president. Um, so they came from the Senate or the House of Representatives. Everybody else comes from the military, vice president, a governor. I think a handful did make the jump from, obviously, secretary of state or something of that nature. Um, but that's not very common, actually. Another uh, distinct facet of, of our system that I will point out. Under the Constitution, no member of Congress can be a member of the executive branch. You can't serve in two branches at once. That would violate the separation of powers. So persons chosen um, by the prime minister to be in the government, like I said, are always, or ministers, I should say, to be in the cabinet, are almost always members of the parliament, right? In our system, you rarely, if ever, choose a member of the legislature to be a member of your cabinet. Think about it. In doing so, you would actually force a member of your party to resign their position in the Congress to help you work over in the White House. Now, depending on how that goes in certain states, like we said previously in, in Chapter 9 when I was talking about how 9-11 showed us a gaping hole in the Congress. If you were to ask a member of the House of Representatives to join you in the cabinet, that seat would have to be replaced by another election, meaning your party could lose that seat. You could be giving the opposite party, the opposition party, a seat in the House of Representatives you had originally won. For Senate... Some states allow a governor to replace a vacant Senate seat by appointment, but some of them don't, and you would have to have yet another runoff, which means, again, you could open the door to the opposition party gaining representation in the Congress if you appointed members of the legislature to be on your um, cabinet staff. 
you know, of the 15 heads of cabinet level departments in the first uh, George W. Bush administration, only four had been members of Congress. It is customary that presidents will choose close personal friends, campaign aides, um, members of certain constituencies, experts, whatever, to fill up their cabinet. You know, you go get um, former brain surgeon and presidential candidate Ben Carson to be in charge of this. You go get um, maybe you you appoint a governor who's you know either recently lost election or whatever. You go get. Um, in the case of Richard Nixon, you get Harvard political science professor Henry Kissinger. Um, you go get, you know, experts in various fields. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, um, the guy who was Secretary of Defense for JFK and LBJ, who was there during the Cuban Missile Crisis, etc. He was the president of the Ford Motor Company before he got the job as Secretary of State. Um, or Secretary of Defense, excuse me. Now, for those of you who are like, what? He made the Ford Motor Company incredibly profitable and successful by streamlining and changing the way they did certain things. And President Kennedy said, I need you to make the military that cost effective. Um, but anyhow, it is actually more common for you to get a non-politician to be a member of your cabinet if you're president. Whereas if you're prime minister, they're always a member of the legislature or the parliament. Um, <clears throat> now... A prime minister's party or coalition, as I said, always has the majority. You always have control of the government. That's how you got the job of prime minister. There's no such thing as a minority prime minister. Um, a president, on the other hand, does not have a guarantee of having a majority of his party in control. Um, the opposite party may be in control of one or both houses of Congress. It happens. Um, now, as we talked about, it's hard to get Congress to play nice on a good day. Make it divided government. It can get even worse. But here's a fun fact. Unified government is not a guarantee to success either. Okay? I'll give you an example. When President Kennedy became president in 1961, his party held a major majority in the House and in the Senate. Kennedy, though, did not get a lot approved in his first couple years as president. Why? Um, he had a bunch of, of Democrats, but he had trouble getting civil rights legislation passed, school funding. He, he tried to create a Department of Urban Affairs and Housing. Um, he had trouble getting a lot of this done. For example, his final year as president, only one-fourth of his proposals were actually passed through Congress. Um, <clears throat> As we shall see here in a moment, yes, they were Democrats, but they weren't John F. Kennedy Democrats. John F. Kennedy and the Southern Democrats did not get along, uh, civil rights being a great example there, right? Um, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter didn't do much better. The Democrats controlled Congress, but most of his proposals either didn't get passed or were greatly changed and modified before they were passed. The only presidents in recent history that had a lot of success because of their majority in Congress, were FDR and Lyndon Johnson. Um, and to be honest, most of Lyndon jo excuse me, most of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's success was in his first term, the first New Deal, um, and even the second New Deal to some degree, but really the first New Deal and the war. Those were really the things that he was successful at. Um, if you remember your American history, uh, and, and Mr. Beasold has a little bit of an advantage on some of you because it's more recent in his, in his schooling, um, but, you know, that second term for FDR, 1936 to 1940, not, a, not exactly a victory parade. Um, he had trouble getting things passed. The Supreme Court shot down a number of his uh, first New Deal proposals, so then he had to try and cobble together, like, replacement programs. But he burned some bridges with the court packing plan. He also lost some credibility because of the old Roosevelt recession that he caused in 1937 when he too rapidly cut funding to things like the PWA and increased unemployment. He, he struggled. Basically, by 1938, he was only able to get a few things through Congress, and many other things were just shot down right there. Um, so again, just having control of that House and Senate with your members of your party doesn't guarantee success. Um, between 1952 and 2016, um, there were 33 congressional elections, okay, and 17 presidential elections. Um, 
I don't know why we have that statistic now that I look at it. Um, you need to change this to 33. Um, oh, it's only counting, excuse me. It's it's counting, I guess, presidentials. Um, oh, I see. I apologize for this. Between 1952 and 2014, you had 32 elections. Um, between 1952 and 2016, you had 33. And I can actually add one more to it, okay? So we'll go ahead all the way up to 2018, okay? But anyhow, between 1952 and 2014, as you can see up here, 20 of 32 elections produced divided government. Um, like I just said, I can actually take it up to um, 2018 for you guys. Between 1952 and 2018, you had 34 congressional elections. Of those 34 congressional elections, they produced divided government 21 times. Because, as we all know, in 2018, the Democrats took control of the House of Representatives. I, again, apologize for the little bit of confusion here. Let's just get to the real point. Divided government is more common than unified government. We, more often than not, as I just said, of the 34 times we've had elections, 21 of them have produced a divided government. Okay? 2016 produ produced a unified government, but then two years later, we went right back to divided government. Okay? You know, we've had 17 presidential elections in that time span um, between 1952 and 2018. Um, and again, all those, you know, 34 congressional, and we've had 21 divided governments out of 34, right? Now, um, <clears throat> you would think that, of course, that just, oh, that's the end of the day, right? Um, it's not. When Donald Trump was elected in 2016, it's only the fifth time. This will put in perspective for you. It's only the fifth time since 1969 that the same party controlled both houses of Congress and the White House. It's only the fifth time we had unified government since 1969, right? Since the 1968 election, okay? So starting with the swearing in of 1969. Um, <clears throat> George W. Bush in 2001, his inauguration actually marked the first time since 1953 that the Republicans had a unified government. The Republicans did have the White House and the Senate during the Reagan years, but they did not have the House. Old Tip O'Neill and the Democrats did. Um, unfortunately for the Republicans, George W. Bush, uh, they lost a Republican in 2002. Um, or excuse me, or actually in 2001, not long after the Senate took over. Um, James Jeffords of Vermont basically became an independent and started voting with the Democrats more regularly. Um, you know, your book goes on through this whole tale. I'm not going to go through all these all these little stories, um, but the back and forth, you know, is quite common. And unified government is becoming increasingly rare. Now, we Americans, we we say we don't like, you know, divided government. We don't like the the bickering. We don't like, you know, Republicans versus Democrats. We don't like the fight between Nancy and Donald and and Mitch and Chuck Schumer and whatever, right? Um, you know, we say that. Um, candidates say that all the time as well. Um, you guys probably, well, you, you won't remember it. You weren't alive yet, and most of you won't be aware of it. But that was that was a major part of the 1992 presidential campaign. You know, in 1992, um, it was it was uh, George H. W. Bush, um, Bill Clinton, and a third party candidate, Ross Perot, who was running what was called the Reform Party, which was all about reforming Washington. Um, <clears throat> all three of the candidates talked about it. All three of the candidates in debates kept talking about how we need to we need to clean up the system. I mean, that was Ross Perot's party's entire thing. Um, Ross Perot's vice presidential candidate, a guy by the name of James um, Stockdale, he uh, he he got made fun of a lot because his his big word was gridlock, right? In a few debates, he just kept saying gridlock, and then Saturday Night Live got to where they made fun of him. The person who played him on SNL, um, he would just yell gridlock randomly, right? That was like his thing. Um, side note, if you ever want to learn about an American hero, learn about Mr. James Stockdale. His actual name is James Bond Stockdale. He was born before Ian Fleming wrote those books, so he's not named after the, the spy. Um, 
But uh, Admiral James Stockdale was shot down in Vietnam and captured and brutally tortured, uh, just like all the other prisoners. Um, he eventually was awarded the Medal of Honor, though, because he um, he actually did things to himself to further injure himself to prevent the Vietnamese from like putting him on TV and a few other things. Um, he went through a lot. So if you're ever interested in learning about um, this you know, truly a great example of an American hero because of, of the sacrifices he made and did to himself. Uh, I highly, I highly encourage it. Like I'm saying, it's, it's unfortunate. He's remembered as a, a, a spoof. He was highly ridiculed by SNL and, and the public in general. His debate performance was atrocious. He was not a good person to have on TV. Incredibly intelligent man, taught philosophy, taught at Stanford, um, wrote books. Uh, he just did not do well on TV. So anyhow, for what that's worth, I know some people don't like prisoners of war, um, but that's their problem. Um, now, <clears throat> anyhow, back to the matter at hand. Um, we talk about, you know, we don't like gridlock. And I like the 1992 example really quickly because you had a third party created that said that they were going to end gridlock. You got a Democrat up there complaining about gridlock. You got a Republican up there complaining about gridlock. You got the two major political parties screaming about gridlock and a third party emerged. Obviously, no one likes gridlock, right? Because that, that became a key part of the campaign. You know, how, how am I going to drain the swamp? Clean, you know, it, the name changes. The phrase changes, etc. It's a common battle cry. It's a battle cry that we hear every election. Right. Everybody's going to go to Washington. They're going to clean up that town. They're not going to be part of the Washington Beltway mess. Right. They're not going to be part of all that. Um, first of all, let's think about this. Is divided government less successful than unified government? OK. Um, you know, is the gridlock, quote unquote, that is created by divided government that much worse? And second of all, I guess what you need to ask yourself, um, is gridlock a bad thing? You know, is gridlock really that bad? Okay, well, let's look at it. For one thing, um, as I said in our last chapter looking at Congress, if you look at the statistics, unified government and divided government aren't that necessarily different uh, when it comes to their, their productivity. David Mayhew studied 260, he's a political scientist, your book noted, um, he studied 267 laws enacted between 1946 and 1990. He said that these laws were likely to be passed when different parties controlled the White House and Congress, um, just as much as they were as if the same party controlled both. Then he basically argued that there was no difference that he could see in the likelihood of these being passed in unified or divided government. And what he did was he, he looked at bills of similar nature, you know, scope, et cetera, and he looked at them during periods of both unified and divided government and found that their, their odds were basically the same. It didn't really change. Um, for example, 1948 Marshall Plan, where we agreed to spend billions of dollars to rebuild Europe. Um, passed by a divided government. The 1986 Tax Reform Act, which was a big thing for Ronald Reagan, passed by a divided government, a government where a strong Democratic uh, majority controlled the House of Representatives. So it doesn't appear that divided government means nothing gets done. We've talked about this. Um, divided governments do about as well as unified when it comes to passing major legislation or ratifying treaties and things of that nature. Um, it's the little, the little, little things um, where maybe divided government trips you up because they aren't hot ticket items that you can rally large numbers around. But in general, divided government gets the job done. It obviously gets the job done since America functions under divided government more often than unified government. I would assume that America doesn't spend the majority of its time unable to do anything. Okay. Why do divided governments produce about as much legislation as unified. Let's get that figured out too, right? Why does it seem that there's no statistical difference between a divided and unified government? It's because unified government's a myth, okay, um, in a way. Definition-wise, yes, unified government occurs, but in practicality, actual functionality, unified government doesn't really exist that often. Why? Just because you say you're a Republican doesn't mean you agree with all the other Republicans or you think like every Republican or you might agree with the Republican president. Okay, 
there are branches of parties. There are wings, right? You know, you've got all these Democrats, and they've all got different opinions on on certain things. Some are far left. Some of them are like Bernie Sanders, and they advocate socialism. Some of them are more moderate, and they aren't socialists. And so there you go. Not all Democrats are cut from the same cloth. Same thing with Republicans. You've got very, very conservative to Republicans. You've got moderate Republicans. I think there are a couple liberal Republicans that are in hiding somewhere. Um, you know, there used to be more of them before things got way partisan and split. You've got uh, what we would call neocons or neoconservatives. Um, that's another one. Not to go too far off the rails, hopefully, this time. Neocons are an interesting group to look at. Neocons, the neoconservative movement, is the result of basically people that were once Democrats basically abandoning the Democratic Party in general and joining the Republican Party um, because they are conservative in certain aspects, but they actually aren't as conservative as old school conservatives, hence neoconservative or neocon. Um, you know, they feel like there needs to be a little more of an interventionist policy on foreign affairs, but they are a little more liberal minded when it comes to social matters and, th you know, they don't really fit the mold of the old school conservative. Um, and so the only way you have truly unified government is if you have a majority of your ideological wing of the party. OK, you know, Republicans, again, Southerners tend to be more really conservative than Midwesterner or Westerners in the Republican Party. Um, you know, West Coast liberal or West Coast Democrat, probably a little different in their approach to the world than a Democrat from, you know, Tennessee. Um, you've got to have unity in the party ideology, not just in the label, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson could not get many Democratic members to support his war in Vietnam. He had a majority in the Congress, but most Democrats weren't eager to go to war in Vietnam. Now, they did agree with him on matters like um, the new, you know, the Great Society, you know, the war on poverty. Um, Jimmy Carter, he couldn't get the democratically controlled Senate to ratify his strategic, his strategic arms limitation. Um, you know, 1933, Franklin Roosevelt, he did not, he not only had a Democratic majority, he had a majority of Democrats that were in the mood to try his radical ideas, radical for the time, uh, the New Deal, right? Guys that were willing to go for the change, the, the out-of-the-box thinking. When he first became president, Lyndon Johnson had a lot of liberal Democrats that were willing to support things like um, civil rights legislation, Medicare, etc., and he got that done. But as I just said, there were limits. War in Vietnam? No. You know, Roosevelt had a bunch of Democrats that were willing to try the New Deal in 33, but by 37, he'd lost that, right? So you've got, he still had Democrats, but they weren't New Deal Democrats. There were more conservative Southern Democrats that were there and, and, and people who kind of turned against the New Deal as too much government. So you've got to have when you want to have truly unified, you have to have unified in the sense of it's, it's ideologically unified. Now, here's something else you have to realize. Gridlock is part of our system. All these people are taught we're going to get rid of the gridlock. You can't get rid of the gridlock. Gridlock is a consequence of our political system because we don't have true democracy. Okay, We don't have majority rules. We've talked about this in this class a number of times. We don't. We don't have true democracy. We've got a representative. Representative. Uh, I apologize. Representative system. Okay. We have a representative democracy, which means minority groups. Forty-three. You know, if somebody wins fifty-seven, forty-three, th those forty-three don't get ignored. Those forty-three still get heard. They just might not get exactly what they want, but they're going to get some of what they want. And so gridlock is a part of our system. It causes delay and debate and compromises. Um, if you want a streamlined, ultra-efficient government, you want direct democracy, which is a dictatorship of the majority, right? The tyranny of the majority, as John Adams called it. Um, gridlock is a part of our way. And I will also point out, do you, you know, is, is gridlock always bad? As I said, we had to address that. Is gridlock always bad? I say no. 
um, because gridlock forces the compromise and it forces the middle ground and it prevents one group from getting too much power and it guarantees that minorities aren't totally ignored. Um, and I know some of you are like minorities. Catholics are not a majority in this country. Um, white college educated males are not a majority in this country. Um, basically, most of the people at Covington Catholic do not represent a majority group. Actually, no one at Covington Catholic represents a majority group because there's really no majorities in America. Everything's a coalition. Um, gridlock benefits, every, it's, it's one of those give and take, it's a double edged sword. You know, you get some, you get stuff through gridlock. You have to give up stuff thanks to gridlock. Um, so it cuts both ways. Now that means that the power of the president is really it's not about the powers of the president. We're going to learn about the powers of the president coming up, and I'm trying to wrap this up. I've gone a lot longer than I originally thought I would. Um, it's not just about the powers of the president. What's important is the power of the president relative to the Congress. And, and the power of Congress relative to the president, right? It's that interaction. Their powers are clearly defined. And I, I say the word clearly with air quotes, um, because as we've kind of learned, government finds loopholes. Um, but really what's important is how, how, is the, how is the president received and how does he wield his power and influence relative to what's going on in Congress? And is there strong leadership in Congress? And is there strong party unity? You know, it's that interplay. There's a lot that goes on that we have to kind of take into account, right? But in the next um, bit, we are going to look at the actual powers of the presidency. Um, and I believe we will also look at the evolution of the power of the president a little bit um, and kind of see how that has changed over time. Um, but that is, again, for another lecture.